I shall just plunge in with what I am here to do, which is to give you some book reviews. Um, this is my first one. Okay, so it's um, Emi Yagi's Diary of a Void, and this one comes to us from Harville Sacker, which is a penguin imprint. And um, it's a quiet, subtle read. This one I thoroughly enjoyed. It's, um, should we say, contemporary Japanese fiction translated by David Boyd and Lucy North. It's a great book. It's um, set in contemporary Japan. We have a young woman called Miss Shibata, Shibata who is um, working in an office that makes paper, reams and reams of paper. And she is more... Uh, She's not the token female, but she really is the office girl Friday, as well as doing her job. She's sort of running around the place making coffees and um, clearing up ashtrays with overflowing cigarette butts. She's not entirely happy about this. So her plan um, to make her life more bearable is one day she decides mm, she's pregnant. So she announces to everybody that she's pregnant. And this novel is about how she lives out this lie. It is a very interesting look, I think, at also the sort of the mundane living. I think um, Yagi is looking at loneliness, at um, what we do in the name of our job. It's about visibility and invisibility. In invisibility, new word, invisibility. It's about being acknowledged. And this young Miss um, Shibata finds that once she says she's pregnant, um, she becomes visible. People do things in her in her stead, and she um, gives sort of daily reports to people and to us as readers. And the whole thing takes on an almost surreal sort of realness. It's a clever book about the private versus the public life. It's a clever book about how our world changes once we interact with it or if we interact with it differently. It's a little gem. It's funny. Not laugh out loud funny. It's subtle. It's quirky. Um, and I think it's a very enjoyable read if you're looking for something that um, isn't going to sort of, um, you know, shake you up too much. But it really does make you, you stop and think. It's sort of deceptive deceptive little read, a little bit like our main character. So that's definitely one um, that I enjoyed. Next one up now, this is a collection of short stories called Cautionary Tales for Excitable Girls and it's by Anne Casey Hardy, who's an Australian author. And this comes to us from Scribner. It's quite hard to review short stories because really, and particularly with this collection, you want to review every single story that's in it. Um, but we can't do that, can we? So um, it's what I felt in taking away, f what I took away from the book as a whole was that I felt I'd been walked out onto a sort of, I was going to say precipice, which always makes us think jump. But I think I'd gone to a, onto a narrow ridge and on either side, there is a, a drop away. And on one side, um, some of the stories that the the drop is onto sort of clouds and into softness and into kind of fond stories. There are young women who are growing up, they're innocent and they're becoming aware of themselves. They're funny, they're irreverent, um, they stick up for each other, um, they you know follow their impulses, they have adventures. And um, that's kind of the safe side. And then the other side, obviously, is all a bit spiky, a bit very macabre in places. Um, and it's, it's sort of the perils um, of being a woman and of being um, a young woman sort of coming up against those first instances of where it doesn't all turn out uh, the way you might have hoped. It is about, obviously, loss of innocence. It's obviously... Um, it, but some of the stories, you know, wander right into a sort of surreal territory um, and are a little bit even uh, very unsettling in places, um, which makes them exceptionally delicious, I think. A little bit gothic. Do I mean gothic? Probably gothic in some of them, like the fashioning of a doll's house and doll's houses for doll's houses is like, oh boy, where did she come up with that? Basically as a whole, a very weird, very wild, 
very wicked collection of stories. Um, there are gems that will make you go, oh, that's, that's very sweet, that's really funny. And there are some that make you go, whew, yeah, or I, you know, that was, ouch, that must have been a, a, a sad moment. Um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed them. I found them hair raising in places uproarious and in places very poignant. Highly recommend, highly recommend. Next one. Now this one is uh, The Fortunes of Jaded Women by Carolyn Huyen. Huyen. And it comes to us from Simon & Schuster. It's contemporary fiction. This was an absolute riot. Um, I read it not really knowing what I was going to what I was going to get. We, well, we never know when we open the pages of the book, I suppose. Um, I just had the best time, the best time between the covers of this one. It was it, I read it when I kind of needed a sea change from denser um, literature. Though, mind you, there is nothing fluffy about this. It's as intricate and as complicated as any Shakespearean comedy of errors. It's set in Little Saigon and um, America, and we're, we're dealing with the, where our cast is mostly Vietnamese Americans. And generationally, there, there, there is a curse that's followed a generation of Duong women um, through the generations caused by um, their early ancestor who had, you know, got into the, the, the approved marriage and then ran away for, with someone else, um, well, for love. This was not a good idea. So she gets um, this curse laid. And the curse is that none of the descendants will ever um, give birth to a boy. So it's about women. It's about mothers and daughters. It is only hilarious. We mostly focus on three um, late middle-aged women who have daughters who are coming late teens right up to, to sort of mid-30s and is following their life and loves their, um, their success, their, their inability to achieve or the, the pride they, took, they take in the achievements. Um, it, it was culturally, uh, you know, a very opening kind of read for me because it, it was a, a fascinating um, look maybe a little bit at the stereotype of the, the, the sort of obsessed with what is going to happen to my children and obsessed with worrying about my daughters and all the mistakes they make. But you're laughing all the way through this. These three sisters hate, love each other. And the whole of Little Saigon knows that when they get into a spat, you just sit have another drink and just watch how the whole thing unfolds. It is screamingly funny in places. You you love them all in the long run. Um, there is a ferocious wit. There's a bit of magic, um, in sort of magic in that they they consult the um, sort of that mystical, never growing old sort of stereotype of the the um, little Vietnamese woman who lives on an island and who will get, dispense her wisdom. But she's very lovely. And you know why they go to talk to her, because she does definitely dispense her wonderful wisdom. It's about worrying about your children, over worrying and about learning to, to let go while you're actually holding them tight. A delight. Loved it. This is my next book, This Devastating Fever by Sophie Cunningham. Comes to us from, to us from Ultimo Press. She's an Australian writer, Sophie Cunningham, lots of non-fiction. I was not sideways in a way by this book because I didn't know what I was going to expect. And maybe the when I opened the book, I said, I, you know, am I going to um, you yeah, know, this looks like a comet. This is, looks like it's going to be dystopian fiction. Oof. It was astonishing. So we have, um, there is a dual timeline. We have the main sort of body of the story is our, a, a young author, Alice, or at least, well, youngish. Alice has been struggling with her novel about Leonard Wolf. Um, and she's been sort of, you know, asked to kind of get on with things. Um, she's writing through COVID, which I find interesting because we're going to get a lot of literature on this. And this both thwarts and enables her to do this writing. While she's writing, she is visited by the ghost of said Leonard. And so we have his timeline in Salon where he is, um, you know, ad ad administrator for the, for the colony and offering, you know, he's an 
yes, for, for a colonial imperialist, if you like. And he's, he's talking about his life in Salon, which he, he truly loves. But his ghost, who appears to our young author Alice, um, comments in a very postmodern sort of way on his own life and experiences and feelings. And of course, you can't, well, you can, which is what Sophie Cunningham wanted to do. You, you can have Leonard Wolfe without Virginia Woolf, but obviously we have to write her into it. And she visits as well as a ghost, peevish and a little bit brittle. But um, I think Cunningham wants um, us to look at or have a, have a, a, a bit of a r romp. It's also very detailed. Um, look at the Bloomsbury set about their, their shenanigans, the way they lived, the way they um, did or didn't have sex with everybody. And that's where our title comes from because Leonard Wolf thought that sex itself was a devastating fever. Um, it's a very, very clever book. Lots of notes, lots of citation, lots of material. It's very layered. And I loved it. Ultimately, I loved everything about Leonard and about uh, Virginia, the way they talked to and about each other, how their ghosts would comment their lives. And I, I really, I found it fascinating, the parallels between the end of the era, the end of colonialism. We're in... Um, in that sort of foreboding or the, the end of the world as we know it and how we may look at this COVID and environmental collapse and think, you know, that's, we can have some of those conversations around that. It's, it's, it's not just thought provoking. It's, it's more than that. It's kind of like, oh my goodness, you know, it's, it's a jolt of a, of a thinking book. Absolutely superb. And it merits rereading. Last one up for today, one that a lot of us had been waiting for and now we have it and we're all very, very happy, is Maggie O'Farrell. Um, the Marriage Portrait, this comes to us um, from Tinder Press, which is an implant, implant, imprint of a headline publishing and historical fiction again. Um, look, Hamnet was a superbly hard act to follow, possibly. But she has done it again because this she has pulled a dazzler out of her hat yet again. It is based on the true story of Lu Lucrezia. She's a blah, 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 de Medici. They have by 17 names. And her father was the Duke of Tuscany. So we're in this 1560s world of um, arranged marriages, um, power grabs, and oh, how women are treated and how men are treated. And the real life story of Lucrezia is, is just the springboard for this. Um, so we have this young girl, Lucrezia, who's um, living a secluded life, mostly well protected in, in um, Florence. And we realize that she's a bit of a fireball. She's feisty, she's very artistic and is very drawn to the arts. Um, and she's quite different from her brothers and sisters. There seems to be a, a sort of roiling kind of passion inside her, but she is biddable. She is then, uh, on the, the death of her sister, who was to be um, betrothed, or was betrothed and was to be married to the Duke of Ferrara, one Alfonso, she finds out to her surprise that he's going to marry her. And he has to wait a bit for her because she's very young, so at 15. Where our novel opens, she's sitting at a dinner table with this very charming Alfonso. He has brought her out to his hunting villa and she knows he's going to kill him. He is going to kill her. The real life Lucrezia was, um, did die one year into her marriage and it was either some putrid fever or else he murdered her. There was a lot of it going on those uh, in those days. There is a wonderful... Um, narrative in here. It's not just her working out what's happening, but also um, she gets her portrait painted and her husband is all the time kind of sort of surveying this. And um, she, you know, she she makes a connection with one of the um, painter, painter apprentices, the portraitist's apprentice. And there's a little bit of a, you know, an interest in each other going on. But you, you know, you're well aware that none of this is, can be a, a in any way contemplated because she has a very controlling um, husband. Of course, there are no children from this union and thereby 
this this is where the whole story really comes from. The real life um, or the real facts that um, Farrell is interested in and, and mentions at the end of her book is that the these marriages between these aristocrats or these ducal families were based on you know how much title what the titles your title you would inherit what was the land and dowry you'd inherit and whether your wife would produce children and if she didn't she had to be disposed of and they were disposed of in the most I mean they were recorded as dying as suffocating unhappily. Uh, suffocating in, the, in their sheets or strangled by a dog leash um, all sorts of very imaginative um, demises but um, this is what she is writing into it's a fabulous rich read you get a huge sense of the history of the time and it's it's more than highly recommended it's just what I suppose all the way through it you're what she's hooking you on is can we save Lucrezia. Does she do that? Of course you want to read it. That's it. Those be the books. Um, I hope you have enjoyed this. Um, I have enjoyed every single one of those books. They all give me something different and that's what books are for. Um, if you're in my neighbourhood, come and get them. Um, I would love to see you and if not, go to your local bookshop and ask for them because every single one of them is worth it. I will see you again when I see you again. <laughs>